Last week, all the political world was wondering who was Bill Kristol talking about when he suggested that there was going to be a third party presidential bid by someone with a good chance of winning. Turned out he was talking about our next guest, David French, who's a lawyer, a writer for National Review, a veteran of the Iraq War, and a Tennessean. French announced on Sunday he was not going to enter the race. And he joins us now to talk about all of this. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. When was the very first time in your life someone suggested to you or you thought about the notion of running for president? <laughs> About a little less than two weeks ago, uh, meeting with Bill Kristol and talking about the times that we're in. And, uh, you know, I think that there's uh, almost two categories of people that are emerging right now. Those who understand the gravity of the challenge we're facing in politics now and how serious, for example, the threat to, of Donald Trump is, not just to politics, but to civil society, as we've seen in this, in this judge controversy. And those who think we're in some sort of land of politics as usual, just with a little bit more outrageousness to it. Uh, I'm in the in the camp that under, that believes and understands this is something else entirely. And when other people weren't stepping up, and Bill asked me if I'd consider it, uh, I I said yes, I would consider it. So did he tweet when he tweeted to suggest that it was happening? Because he had you in <laughs> mind. Was that with your authorization? Did you let him to believe you were going to do it? Uh, I, I that was a surprise. I have to say. <laughs> well, surprise they did. But but did he have reason to believe that at that point you were going to do it? I, he had reason to believe I was thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, he wouldn't have just tweeted that out as some sort of. Well, but he tweeted that it was happening, not he that you were thinking it about it. It will happen. You know. It's easy to read an awful lot into 140 characters. Yeah. It was it was a process under consideration, and you know I I fully recognize, uh, gentlemen, that. Uh, I don't have name recognition, uh, but I also recognize, and I heard this analogy today, that the, the demand for an alternative, it's almost like a pressure cooker, that there is an enormous amount of pent-up demand. Even people who are supporting Trump are doing so very reluctantly. There's a segment of Democrats supporting Hillary Clinton very reluctantly. So there's pent-up demand there. We need the right person to release that demand into our culture, into our politics. And so recognizing the pent-up demand, you know, I wanted to give it serious thought to see if, you know, there was a chance that I could that I could be helpful in that process. Was there was there one decisive factor, or what were the decisive like the key decisive factors that led you to conclude that, you know, this was just not something for you to do? You know, I'll, I'll tell you, it's it's very simple. Uh, I believed honestly at the end of the day, even though there wasn't really anyone stepping up, uh, waiting in the wings at that time, that I would end up doing more harm than good. Um, that I'd heard a lot of people saying. Well, you know, you, you have a, a, a good biography and people will like you when they get to know you. But, you know, in that circumstance, that's a huge challenge. There's a need for a person with an existing constituency. And if I went forward and it fizzled, which was a likelihood, um, then it would give a misimpression to the American people and to the larger body politic that there's fewer people like me than there really are, people who are, are uh, disgusted with the status quo. And so, it's better for there to be somebody who has that constituency to take advantage of the 65 percent of American people who are willing to look for a third alternative. There are people, um, friends of Bill Crystal's and others, who right now are back at it, especially in the yes. wake of the Judge Curiel comments, trying to find someone to pick up this mantle. Are you actively involved in that process at all? Uh, I have been involved in meetings where, where we are directly talking about that, and I know there will be people who will be approached specifically. And, and I hope that, you know, they can consider it in a different atmosphere that I did, which is not with everyone talking about it, but take some time with their families and think about it quietly, run the traps on it, take a look at the actual numbers, the actual work that's been done, and I think they'll see it's very viable. I assume you're not interested in breaking news on who those people are right now on the show. Under the golden rule of I would not like to do to others that I, the, what, what, the same experience I had, no. So no. what kind of people are you talking about? People that you know, will be approached? I mean, again, people like yeah. you or people who are more conventionally uh, suited maybe to running for president? I think if there's one thing we learned in this process with me, uh, guinea, I'm so happy to serve as a guinea pig here, um, was that... Uh, Number one, there is demand. There were people contacting me from all over the country. I'm willing to quit my job tomorrow to help you. But if you want to get the $25 million or so that's necessary to really explode out on those ballots, you need that existing constituency. And that's something that I lacked. And so, you know, the message that we can give to somebody else is pretty clear. If you have that existing constituency, if you either have money yourself or you have access to fundraising, quick access to fundraising network, it is there. All that stuff you hear about a ballot access problem being insurmountable, false. All that stuff that you hear about third party candidates never have a chance. So when, since when has this cycle been normal? 
So um, you, you, the French presidential campaign lasted about a week, a little bit less. Well, we'll call um, it the potential. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I know you had some unpleasant aspects of it, but just talk about what it was like for your family to see you on the news everywhere and people <laughs> talking about you in a way that had never happened before. What was that like in the, up, the upside of it? Well, you know, I, well, was there an upside? I'm trying to think. Um, be kind of heady. No, not really. I mean, you know, I, our family has already experienced the downside of being against Trump and, and not in that circumstance, not yeah. from the Trump campaign, but the Trump supporters. Yeah. Um, it was a circumstance, you know, look, I, my older kids understand what's going on. My wife understands what's going on. She's opposed to Trump and to Clinton and she knows the gravity of the time. So it was a weighty thing. It wasn't a it wasn't a heady you're, moment. You're a man who thinks of everything. So and I'm sure you thought ahead. Let's hear your what was the zinger you were going to use on the debate against Trump? Let's hear one of those zingers. <laughs> this, Come on. The zinger that yeah. I was going to use. Yeah. You know, all I was going to do with Trump was remind him of what he said. You know, he was going to try to pretend to the American people that he was a serious candidate for president. And I was going to remind the American people that he thinks that Exxon can help beat ISIS. Would you have been nervous in the debates? Oh, of course. I mean, I'm a, a rational human being. Who wouldn't be nervous in the debates? I'm sure Trump was at least once or twice. You don't seem nervous now. <laughs> uh, you know, I hide it well. Maybe I have I'm a better I'm predicting right now you're going to be an excellent Jeopardy answer at some point. <laughs> That's my prediction. Maybe in the $200 category. <laughs>